at Times Square Church. We were called to pray for New York City. But who would have known that it was going to be for 9-11? Pastor Dave right away recognized that this is something unusual. Most people were still going about their day. They were ordering their coffee in the Starbucks. They were buying newspapers at the newspaper stand. A plane coming down the river and just banked over the Statue of Liberty and then went right into the South Tower. This is something serious. The second plane hit the towers and then the towers fell and your reaction of just like, is this real? The sky was completely black from suit. People looked like ghosts and they were in shock. It felt like I was watching an action movie. I just bowed my head and started crying out to God to please touch them, to please touch their hearts. What was clearly um, going to be the last moments for many of the people on those floors. This was God speaking to us and letting us know that this was what was coming ahead. You're listening to Beyond 9-11, The Impact of Prayer. Eyewitness accounts from members of Times Square Church who saw the devastation with their own eyes, with their hearts, prepared by God for that very day. Here's Carter Conlon, senior pastor of Times Square Church in New York City. God, in His mercy, gave us a word of warning about the days that were coming to us. I remember coming home one day from Rochester, driving home, reading in the car the book of Hebrews as somebody else was driving the vehicle. And as I began to read it, there was a strong, strong impression came to my heart that we as pastors had to teach this church in New York City how to come to the throne of God to find grace to help concerning a time of need that was yet to come. I couldn't explain it. It was something of the Spirit that was spoken to my heart. I remember coming back to the church and speaking it to the other pastors. There was an immediate witness that this was the voice of God. God was cautioning us about something that was to come into the city. I remember as vividly as yesterday in the month of July when the presence of the Lord became so powerful in the church that there was a stillness that would come upon the congregation. Sometimes for up to 20 minutes, we would sit completely quiet and completely still in the presence of God. I remember specifically one time the choir trying to sing a song, getting partway through it and just stopping dead in the middle of the song. They couldn't continue because the presence of God had come into the sanctuary. There was just like a presence of God and there was a stillness of God. Pastor Dave right away recognized that this is something unusual. So he got up to the microphone and he just said, listen, I'm not leaving. If you want to leave, you can leave, but I'm staying right here because obviously this is the Lord and I really don't know what to do. That's what he said. So we just sat there in silence. It was just uh, quietness. And we sat there for like another hour. But I remember in these pockets of silence, a lot of people were being ministered to. And God was teaching us, you know, just to rest and hear his voice. It was kind of like a mixture of Psalm 46, that we are not to fear, we are not to be troubled, and that the Lord would keep us, but that we would look up because when all of these things happen, our redemption draws nigh. And it was just an amazing time for the congregation. Something was coming to New York and he just felt the urgency for, for prayer. We would sit for what seemed like just a few minutes and it would be an hour had gone by of, or 45 minutes of when everybody was just very still in the presence of the Lord. And God was preparing us. We didn't know what for or what was happening, but we knew that God was doing a deep work in all of our hearts and preparing us. As we opened the doors of the church, it was unusually and uncommonly silent. So we went to an usher, we opened the door and asked, what's going on? Because nobody was moving in the sanctuary. There was no sound. The pastors were sitting. Nobody was saying a word. You could hear a pin drop. And then the usher said, it's been like this for a while. So we were like, what's going on? And so we sat down and that began the, the whole period where the pastors wouldn't know what to do, and I recall clearly, like Pastor David, getting up several times and saying, folks, I don't know what to do, we just have to wait on the Holy Spirit. But it was a call, eventually, to pray for New York City, and then all the events were canceled, and so on and so on. For me, looking back, the fact that we were called to pray, I mean, and so often at Times Square Church, we were called to pray for New York City. But who would have known that it was going to be for 9-11? 
So we prayed for New York City. And I think the time that 9-11 happened, I believe the main work that God wanted was already done. I believe that the work that he called the church to do beginning in July was to intercede and to pray. So we were ready for what was already done, meaning we prayed. I remember very quietly just walking over to my seat. But when I sat in my chair, there was this battle going on with something inside of me. Now I know that it was the Lord, but something inside of me and just in my physical being, I wanted to run out of there. There was something just in my flesh that did not want to be there. And I remember holding the armrest of the chairs and just keeping my eyes closed, almost like I felt like I was anticipating a roller coaster ride. And I kept my eyes closed. And in my mind, I'm going, God, what is this? I want to leave. I was just so scared. Very quietly, the Lord just said, Nancy, you need to sit here and you need to understand that this is me. And I was like, okay. And Pastor Dave at the time got up and I remember him making the statement that he doesn't know what's about to happen, but obviously the Lord is moving and the Lord is speaking to us. He said, we're just going to seek God. We don't know exactly what's happening, but we're just going to seek the Lord. Pastor of Times Square Church, Carter Conlon. God began to speak to us about a season of hardship coming into the city that we needed to be prepared. As a matter of fact, the word that came to us was a calamity, that people would be running in the streets and they would be terrified. We began to meet at night. We canceled our missions conference. We canceled our women's conference that was already on the schedule. We began to meet and pray almost nightly at one point and asking God for the strength and the grace that we were going to need to get through the days that were just ahead of us. I was, was actually on the runway sitting in an airplane waiting to take on for Pittsburgh. And one of the gentlemen right next to me, one of the guys who worked for me, he said, boy, that's some kind of smoke coming out of the, one of the trade centers. And so you look over, and from Newark Airport, which is right there, that you know, you could look right across the river into the tower, so you could see them pretty clearly. And then said, well, that's a strange flight pattern for that plane to be taken. And we looked out, and it was a plane coming down the river and just banked over the Statue of Liberty, and then just banked deeper and then went right into the South Tower. I heard a plane coming in and it sounded like I was on a runway and you felt the wind come and then when the plane hit the building, the impact shook the street and there were people who were running for cover. So I remember going under the scaffolding and there was a bunch of people there and I just remember just putting my hand out and just fervently praying. We all were just kind of frozen in silence, just watching as the second plane hit the towers and then the towers fell and your reaction of just like, is this real? What are we seeing? On one of the side streets down in Soho, seeing that tower come down and people are just running for their lives. It felt like I was watching an action movie. I was like, this couldn't be happening to us. And then lo and behold, I realized that the six weeks of that silence in the church This was for this moment. This was God speaking to us and letting us know that this was what was coming ahead. It was very surreal as we were looking up. Most people were still going about their day. They were ordering their coffee in the Starbucks. They were buying newspapers at the newspaper stand. And and I remember just being so confused. I didn't understand how the world was continuing to go along its schedule while this tragedy was happening right in front of our eyes. While I was looking up, I saw the fire and saw the floors above the fire and just started to panic for the people that were still left on those floors. I just bowed my head and started crying out to God to please touch them, to please touch their hearts, to call them, to let them hear His voice so that they would turn to Him in what was clearly um, going to be the last moments for many of the people on those floors. One of our staff people had just started working at the church, actually had worked in that building, and so she just fell to her knees sobbing, knowing that a lot of her friends and people she had worked with for years were in that building and and most likely had lost their lives. As I'm running, I saw there was a ton of debris on the floor. There was briefcases, pocketbooks, 
shoes. And at the time, I, I didn't understand why there was all these pocketbooks and shoes on the, the floor. But later, now knowing it was debris from the building. The sky was completely black from soot. And then the street was filled with ash and papers, millions and millions and millions of scraps of paper. And we just all burst out crying because we started picking up little pieces of paper and seeing pieces of people's lives, like everyday lives, so computer printouts, and personal things, and realizing that the impossible had indeed happened and that this was real. The street started filling up with people who had been walking from downtown, either taking the subways or, or walking the long distance, and they were covered with white. They looked like ghosts, and they were in shock. So they weren't walking as they normally would. They were almost in a zombie state. Many, many of them had either lost their shoes while running or it seemed like a lot of people weren't even sure where to go or where to head because this wasn't their, their normal routine or neighborhood. With Carter Conlon, pastor of Times Square Church in New York City, you're listening to Beyond 9-11, The Impact of Prayer. By God's grace, when 9-11 happened here in New York City, as a congregation, we were ready. I remember people coming into the church specifically with their rolling their sleeves up, saying, Pastor, tell us what to do. We're ready to work. They weren't terrified because we had been warned. We had been prepared. We were ready. We were ready for people coming down the streets terrified who were stranded in Manhattan and couldn't get out of the city. We brought them into the church. We housed some of them because there were no hotels available in the city at one point. We gave people food, but most importantly, we had a word for them and were able to give them the spiritual comfort that so many people were needing. I remember night after night in this church, people giving their lives to Jesus Christ. Now, God himself knows the sincerity of that profession. I can only tell you what I saw with my eyes. The people were kneeling in the aisles one night. It was creating an actual fire hazard in the church. But I can say with rejoicing in my heart, although it was a difficult time for all of us, we had a word from God. We were prepared for the moment. We were able to provide food, clothing, shelter, and hope and help and lead people to salvation in Christ who were terrified by what they were experiencing. Now that wasn't the case everywhere. We heard stories about churches that were filling up, but the theological focus of the churches, they weren't prepared for the days that we had entered into. And sad to say, there was no word there was nothing there prepared for the people. The people of the congregation were just as terrified as the people in the city all around them. Pastor Carter was very quick to want to respond and to do something. I mean, we just went downstairs and just took funds from the church and went straight to a grocery store, just buying food to be able to help the people that might come because we didn't know, A, if this would continue, what was going to happen after this. You know, were there going to be people that needed to come to the church? I know that Pastor Carter immediately was like, we'll make the church open and available for anybody that needs to come. If the people don't have a place to stay, we can turn the second floor into beds. You know, He was willing and ready to do anything that we needed to do as a church to be open in this moment that people needed the Lord. And he wanted to be able to have places available and people available to minister to people, to pray with them if they needed prayer, you know, so we just didn't know what to expect. And so we were ready for that, and that's why we were out there buying food and bringing it back to the church. As the firemen came into Ground Zero, we were able to hand them masks and different things, water, things that they would need going in there. And then on their way back out, we would usually hand them dry socks and things for their feet because um, they would be so wet from working on the site. And there was a few of us who worked down there. We were working in conjunction with some restaurants that were in um, some of the suburbs that were providing food, so we had hot meals as they were coming out. There was another group that were setting up bedding in one of the buildings, so the firemen who, many of them didn't want to leave. They wanted to stay. They had lost their comrades and even family, so they spent the night, and we spent the night. We stayed three or four nights all night. We just stayed down there on site and then just giving out food and handing things out to the firemen and to the volunteers who were coming in. We looked out the door of the truck and realized that we were smack in the middle of a military convoy. Seriously, there was like a, either a truck in the back, another truck in the front, there was some kind of um, tank or something, and it's the first time ever I've ever seen military vehicles in uh, New York City and on the West Side Highway, I'll never forget. 
So people were actually cheering the coming in of the troops. And some way, somehow, God put us right in the middle. And we didn't think this was happenstance. We thought this was the Lord giving us bodyguards and escorts. I went to Union Square, and I started seeing the posters and pictures of loved ones. People were reaching out. Did you see my brother? Did you see my wife? Have you seen this person? It was just photo after photo after photo. It was never ending. And it was something that I think I will always walk away with. One particular woman, she came in and she was very distraught and just begged us and asked us if she could volunteer and help us. And we said sure and asked her her story. And she had lost her father and her brother and they were still looking for her. And of course, she was praying that they would be found alive. And, you know, she basically just said, I can't watch TV anymore. I have to come here. I have to do something. So she just begged us in tears, like, please let me stay with you guys and and let me help volunteer. Carter Conlon, senior pastor of Times Square Church. The question is, will God speak to us about the days that are just ahead? You and I know that the days ahead are foreboding. There are warning signs everywhere. As a nation, we are socially, politically, spiritually, economically, we are headed into an abyss. Everything around us seems to be collapsing. Civility has gone out the window. Intelligent discussion seems to be something of of a decade ago. People are simply trying to yell the loudest and to get their viewpoint across. It is amazing what's happening to this society. Evil is becoming good. Good is becoming evil. We're doing exactly what they did in the book of Acts chapter 27. When the storm hit and it looked like the ship was going to go down, they began to throw out the tackling of the ship at one point. And when you think about it, things that had been proven, things that had given direction for generations were suddenly thrown overboard and counted as worthless because of the magnitude of the storm that had come upon them. We are in this nation today throwing overboard things that have been proven, things that we have, we have walked in, things that God has spoken to us, and we're creating a new society. And God help us if we don't have a moment to stop and reflect on the way that we're going. Will God speak to us about the days? Can we hear his voice as a church? And if so, Will we be able to hear it? How will we be able to hear the voice of God? And if not, what would cause our ears to be closed to the voice of God in this generation? The prophet Amos, speaking to the people of Israel, and of course to us today through his writings, is telling us the various reasons why people find themselves unprepared for certain calamitous days that have come upon the world and I believe, of course, are coming upon us in our generation. Here's what he says in Amos chapter 6. Woe unto them that are at ease in Zion, and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. He says in verse 3, you put far away the evil day and cause the seat of violence to come near. In other words, you, you have a theological focus and perspective, and, and your focus is all about blessing. It's all about the now. It's all about personal comfort. And you put away any thought that calamity might be coming your way. And because you're not really, really giving a visible display of who God is, you're causing this seed of violence to come near. In other words, this this day of reckoning with the society is coming more rapidly towards you because there's nothing to stop it. It's a type of our church in our day. Is a church that, he says in verse 4, you lie upon beds of ivory. They stretch themselves upon their couches. They eat lambs out of the flock and calves out of the midst of the stall. They chant to the sound of the vial. They invent to themselves instruments of music like David. They drink wine in bowls, anoint themselves with the chief ointments, but they're not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. In other words, here's a whole form of godliness without power. The whole focus is on oneself. It's a selfish focus. And we have done this in America. It's been more than a couple of generations that we've been focusing on ourselves. Our theological focus is on the betterment of ourselves. It's on, it's on the enhancement of ourselves. It's, on, it's Everything is about self. And therefore, he says now in verse 7 of Amos chapter 6, shall they go captive with the first that shall go captive, and the banquet of them that stretch themselves shall be removed. In other words, they're going to be caught unprepared, and they're going to be taken out first. It's an amazing thing that religion in itself, if it's not given a right focus— It's not going to provide the comfort that people need in the future. Peter the Apostle even says in the last days there are going to be scoffers saying, where's the promise of his coming? Uh, All things are continuing just as they have for thousands of years. Don't listen to these guys that 9-11 was just a precursor of something much bigger coming to the nation. 
These guys are just alarmists. Look, everything is continuing. Don't listen to those that are telling you that Christ is coming soon because they've been saying that for 2,000 years and he hasn't come. And the reason for this is their whole focus is about themselves. It's about their ministries. It's about the grandeur of what they're building. And it's about reputation. It's, it's really got no heart, as uh, Amos said, for Joseph, for the man or the woman in captivity. But in contrast to this, God says through the prophet Isaiah in chapter 58, verses 6 to 11, Is not this the fast that I have chosen? Now here, I want you to look at this. This is an outward focus. We're not focused on ourselves, but we're focused on living for the benefit of others. To loose the bands of wickedness. I want you to compare this now with with Luke chapter 4, verse 18, with what Jesus said his ministry on the earth was. To undo the heavy burdens. To let the oppressed go free. And that you break every yoke. We're actually hearing Luke 4, 18, here through the prophet Isaiah. Is it not to deal your bread to the hungry, and that you bring the poor that are cast out to your house? In other words, reach out and bring in those that have no resources and have no strength. Bring them to the house of God. I mean, if that's one of the ways of interpreting this. Now look at the promise. Then shall your light break forth as the morning, and your health will spring forth speedily. Your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your protection, your rearward. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. This is when you will pray and God will actually speak to you. You will cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away from the midst of the yoke and the putting forth of the finger, in other words, little insignificant things to say that we're doing something for somebody, or, or it also can mean the blaming others for the problem and saying, well, it's not my problem. I didn't create this. An empty talk, speaking vanity. And if you draw out your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall your light rise in obscurity and your darkness, even the darkest times, will be as the noonday for you. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and make fat your bones. And you'll be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. And here's where God clearly says, the way I see it, if you're willing to live for others on this earth, I will speak to you and you will hear my voice. I remember the people in this church, when the towers were hit, it's not like we had some kind of a, a spiritual delusion that made us happy, but people were of good cheer because they knew that God was in control of everything around them, that God was had warned them, God had told them, I'm going to give you strength and you're going to be a blessing to the city. For this reason, we had the first truck on site at Ground Zero uh, feeding people and giving uh, supplies to the first responders for the first three weeks and were able to be involved in, in, in all kinds of activities that went on in the city uh, to help because we're not caught unprepared as a people. With Times Square Church being in the middle of New York and right there in Times Square, it really became a, a hub for anybody that was from a Christian organization called into Times Square Church and said, how can we help? What can we do? So people either started donating funds or as we started to create a list of organizations and people that were willing to help because of the people that were downtown or people that were positioned around some of these city organizations. I know there was a couple people that we work with that were there that were talking to people on the site that we're able to say, no, this is what the need is right now. Because that need would change as the day went by or as the days went by and just get stuff like socks or shovels or brooms. All I mean, the stuff that they were needing was, the list was huge, you know, and the entire office was transformed. We were no longer just a church office. We were no longer just a missions office. Everybody was working together to do what we could do as a church to minister to the community that we were in because that is what the church is for. We were so thankful for God and how he prepared us as a church and as individuals. Of course, you still go through the trauma of the event, but he did prepare us as a people for that day. And as we look to the future and just, you know, praying God will prepare us for anything else that's to come. We had been praying so long in our church for months, praying to the Lord, and we had had a season of quietness, a season of stillness, of seeking the Lord and knowing he was preparing us for, for something that was happening in our city. So we were ready. Our church was ready to move when the time came. But we were blessed. We feel the Lord prepared us to serve, prepared us to think 
outside ourselves, prepared us to to be available for whatever he wanted us to do in that season. And as uh, awful as it was, we just thank the Lord that he had spoken to our church in that way. Here's Pastor Carter Conlon with his closing word of encouragement. One of the reasons the Lord has me calling you to pray is because a hard time is coming. I think it's going to be beyond anything that that you and I have ever experienced in our lifetime. You see it happening in the Middle East. You, you, you're you looking at the world turning their backs on uh, Israel. You're seeing everything fulfilled in our generation. We're seeing the confusion now that's coming into this world, the anti-Christ speech that is rising almost everywhere. And you and I begin to realize that a, a great dearth is coming to the world. This is the reason that the Lord has burdened my heart to call you to prayer. Is not just that I'm looking to give you another spiritual exercise. You have to get to the throne of God now and find grace that's already there to help you in the time of need. It will not only get you through your struggle that you're facing today, but it will get all of us through the struggles that we're going to face collectively tomorrow. And if we're willing to hear the voice of God, we will get through these dark days. We'll get through the trials. When you and I begin to be focused on others, we become the ambassadors of the one who went to a cross and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. May I just add a thought to that? God so loved the world, he left his church here for their sakes. We are ambassadors of the one who gave his last drop of blood for us. And we can't really be ambassadors if we're stretched on couches, singing our own songs and focused on ourselves. Not only do we come blind to the needs of others, we become deaf to the voice of God. And as Amos said, we're the first that go into captivity. Father, we just ask you, God, in Jesus' name. Lord, we're not to be afraid of the coming days. We don't have to hide. We can face them because you have a plan, and your plan always has been that your name be glorified through a surrendered people, that you'll give us compassion to reach those God, who will be afraid, who are even afraid today, Lord, you'll give us the compassion to reach them. You'll give us the resources and the heart. In all of these things, God, will become the source of our joy and the source of our strength. Jesus Christ, touch this country one more time. Give us the ability to go back into prayer, get back into the true work of God, to focus again on the victory of the cross, and to bring people into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. It's time to pray. We invite you to go to www.pray.org. Share your requests with us as well as your answered prayers. Join us for our weekly prayer meeting online. We want to rejoice with you in all that God is doing. That's simply www.pray.org. That's the letter W twice, pray.org. And to God be the glory.